You went back and forth between Rogers and Kohut? Yes. And I thought that going back and forth, I didn't have to we didn't have to choose one. Right. Why not? Why not make both of them useful? Which when I realized that, I thought, well, no shit trick, Tracy. So how does it feel being home? Everybody glad to see you? Friends? Yeah, okay. Everything with the problem. You're back in school. Everything okay at school? Teachers? Yeah. No problems. Mm-mm. So why are you here? I'd like to be more in control. Yes. Why? Uh, so people can quit worrying about me. Who's worried about you? Um, my father, mostly. This is his idea. What about your mother? Isn't she worried about you, too? I, I don't know. Listen, you're... If you're a friend of Dr. Crawford, you're probably all right, but I'll be straight with you. I don't like this already. Well, as long as you're straight. Uh, what do you know about me? Have you talked to Crawford? Yes, he called me on the phone. He told me your name, and uh, he told me to look for you, and he uh, said you had a brother who died. You want to tell me about it? Well, I suppose you talked this over with Crawford at the hospital, right? Right. Good. How'd that go? Didn't change anything. What'd you want to change? I told you I'd like to be more in control. Why? I told you so people can quit worrying about me. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll be straight with you, okay? I'm not big on control. But it's your money. So to speak. So to speak. I'm John Totten, and this is Between Us. I guess my first question is, do you ever think about why in 10 years of meeting, I haven't asked many questions to you about your life? I do. You do? I do, yes. <laughs> do you have any theories? Well, you've said to me on more, more than one occasion that it's really important for you to have somebody that you can talk to and just dump all your thoughts, feelings, whatever. And so the most important thing to me has been the fact that that you want that. And mm -hmm. it's easy to listen to you. And I feel like, it maybe this sounds strange to say, but I feel like I'm getting you more and more over the years. Hmm. So I started going to therapy in 2010. I was in graduate school, and we were required to do 40 sessions. I procrastinated for the first school year, and then I asked a professor for a list of referrals. Like many of my patients and how they found me, I picked the therapist who was my gender and who was geographically the closest to my house. That therapist was Lane Gerber. We're still working together. Although what our work looks like now is much different than what it looked like back then. Back then, I was a messy 28-year-old graduate student. My love life was a mess. Many of my friendships were a mess. I was consumed with learning about psychoanalysis and philosophy, and that was the main thing I had going for me. I didn't work anywhere else or on anything else, so I was pretty poor. And I lived like a 28-year-old bachelor grad student might. I ate poorly, I drank poorly, I slept very little. In almost every way, my life was something that doesn't seem very appealing to me now. My work with Lane, in my opinion, has always been pretty steady and slow. I would say that he doesn't work towards big epiphanies, and he doesn't try hard to bomb me with insight. But I would say that that's exactly what I needed throughout those years. You might find it surprising to hear that this conversation is the most I've ever asked him about his life. I've picked up on pieces of his life here and there over the years. But as much as you hear me interviewing people about themselves, when I show up to Lane's office, I'm usually ready to talk his ear off about whatever is on my mind. And my impression of him is that he appreciates that. 
But all of that is to say that you're about to hear us talk about our working relationship more than we usually do. It stands to reason that, other than my wife, he might be the most influential person in my life over the last 10 years. Without really purposefully injecting any of his own personality into it. And that's what I think is important about the way he works. And it's something that I don't do well with my own patients, but strive to reset and point myself towards all the time. Dr. Lane Gerber directed and taught in the Existential Phenomenological Psychology Department at Seattle University for nearly 30 years. He also works as a psychotherapist in private practice where he treats me. And we spoke together over the phone in the height of the pandemic. In the beginning, I had this stereotype of this Southern boy (laughs) who came into doing, to becoming a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know... Uh, I certainly I didn't know as as I do today that that this southern boy is is so much more hmm. and in in effect I learned from him as we talk not only about him you but also about my own biases about Southern boys. <laughs> I mean, I guess I have my own biases against Southern boys, and I feel a little bit like an anomaly. I can understand that. And yet your, your roots have seemed to me to be different than my stereotype. Mm-hmm. You're certainly... A southern boy in that you come from Chattanooga and some of your some of your customs and so forth are different than mine a nice Jewish boy from Philadelphia Mm -hmm. and somebody who has gone back and forth on uh, on being nice and what that means and is that really what I want Hmm. And the fact that you have your hand in so many different pies and do them so well, whether it's the music or the bits and pieces of, that you tell me about your work as a therapist, I've seen you as, again, as a Southern boy with a multitude of talents. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Ten years ago, I was much more of a mess, I think, than I am now. And I wonder if you had a sense of how much of a mess I was. You know, I did think that things were really messy in your life. Mm Mm-hmm. But that wasn't the only feeling I had. I had the feeling that they were messy, but there was so much more that you revealed and didn't hide over that period of time. So yeah, I knew you were messy, but I didn't think the mess was all of you by any stretch of the imagination. I think that people are going to hear this and think, is this really the lane I know who's making these comments? But it is. In what way? Why would someone say that? Uh, Because I think I have the reputation for being a compassionate and good listener Mm -hmm. and all the other attributes that go with that. But I think that people who know me well know that I don't often suffer fools gladly. (laughs) 
Maybe that's one of the reasons we get along. Mm-hmm. I just want to go back and say that another reason that I haven't asked you a ton of questions about your life, but I've always been interested when you've offered them, it comes also from how I feel when my clients do that to me. How do you mean? I feel somewhat pinned in when that happens to me, somewhat put on the spot. One of the thoughts that goes through my mind is, geez, I see so many clients a week. If they all ask me questions about my life, I'd be talking about myself all the time, and that feels exhausting. Yes. Yes. It, it, to some extent, it can feel good. And yeah. then after a while, it's, okay, this is not about me. This right. is about you and about the two of us. Right. And one thing I think that you and I have in common is that I think you and I both want to feel useful. Without a doubt. Yes. Yes, I do, and and you certainly do too. Yeah. One of the things that I really appreciated about our work together in the early days is that Lane was willing to wear his professorial hat. This was helpful for me in two ways. I could discuss papers that I was working on and get helpful feedback about the theories and theorists I was reading. But the other way in which it was helpful was that it demonstrated for me that it was okay to wear different hats in the treatment room. In my memory, he would always ask my permission. Is it okay if I put on the professor hat for a minute to talk about this with you? Or when I was applying for jobs, he would put on a supervisory hat and give me advice on what to look for in a job. This all might seem like it wasn't in the service of any strict psychoanalytic objective, but it was meaningful to me in that it was caring, but also it wasn't uptight. I've always gravitated towards a less strict or uptight practice. And Lane was a good example that presence and empathy and striving to understand our patients gives us a lot of leeway to behave in different ways if those qualities are what is guiding us. Early on, I remember thinking, I'm not getting a technique, I'm getting a person. This was formative. Though the definition of useful, the definition of useful is both accurate and yet also a very broad one. In what way? Yeah, I mean, I I want to help. And I want to try and understand the smallest detail possible. Because when I follow that along, then whole worlds open up. Hmm. And and I'm sure you're the same way. When Mm -hmm. somebody comes in and says, I feel really bad. I understand that. Mm-hmm. When somebody says to me, the typical words that you hear, especially initially, I feel bad, I feel sad, I feel whatever, I always feel like we're in a very big ballpark now, and I want to know where you are in that ballpark. And the only way I can really do that, just speaking for myself, is... I want you to tell me in as in as fine a detail as possible so that bad turns into leads in so many different directions. I feel bad when my girlfriend started going out with somebody else. Okay, so that gets me a little closer. So I can say that that must have hurt or tell me about how that, how that felt. Can you paint a picture of how you found that out and what happened to you, what went on in your head and your body? Hmm. That's just the way I have working. As you certainly know at this point, I'm not in a rush to put them in some kind of theoretical box. Hmm. At the same time, sometimes those theories give me more, more ears to hear. 
They may not be the right ones, but at least they can lead me somewhere. And then I have the freedom to say, you know, that theory holds up in a lot of places, but not here. Yeah. Being useful doesn't have to be boring either. No, not at all. It's, to me, it's very meaningful. Playful and exciting. Yes. Yes. Like a flower, like a sprout. It All of a sudden, it opens up the word and the world. So now when they say, I feel bad, okay, I, I have a sense of of where we're going with that. Or I have a sense of bad leads to something else, leads to something else. And pretty soon, it's not just bad as a covering for what they don't want to talk about. There's almost, There's been part of me that almost thinks it's a courtesy to let you do your job and let you be useful to me um, in the same way that I feel that from my patients. Yes. Yes. It's a courtesy also, and so often a privilege. It must have been eight or nine years ago. I did a paper on the relationship between Heinz Kohut and Carl Rogers, and you kind of had a, a knowing smirk. And you mentioned that you were at University of Chicago when they both taught there. Am I remembering that accurately? Yes, you are. First, let's get some context. You were born and raised in Philadelphia. Right. How did you get to Chicago from there? Let's see. So I was born and raised in in Philadelphia. And when I was young, whether it's in junior high school or, or high school, the adults in my family, they would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which to them meant, what kind of a doctor would you like to be? <laughs> I was the first born in both sides of my family. So I was the one who, who heard my grandparents' stories about escaping from Russia and at very young ages before they had a sense of anything. And coming to this country without knowing the language, without without really being prepared. And those stories were fascinating to me. Their stories about escaping persecution in Europe must have gotten you thinking about some of the more existential realities. Right. And what do things mean? And how does one arrive at that? Questions which I hoped that I would be able to answer. But the more I thought about them, the more I thought, and I was desperate to find an answer. But the more, as I got older, I thought, you know what? We do things for different meanings, and we say things that we think make sense. And occasionally they do, but more often we're all struggling in this world and we want to know more. So doing something useful or being helpful was in a way my way of trying to, trying to pay back my, my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles. They came to this uh, country struggling for something. They didn't know what, except it was a hell of a lot better than Russia and Eastern European countries. And they didn't know what they were going to find. And they found a lot of good. And they found a lot of not so good. So, so helpful or compassionate or curious or whatever comes into that framework. Helpful or compassionate or curious comes into the framework given to you by your grandparents. Right. The most formative time in our work together 
was in the years I was sort of going back and forth with my wife. For several years, my wife and I were friends, and we were trying to decide if we were going to be more than that. I was in a transitional phase of my life, still a mess and trying not to be a mess, and she knew that I was a mess. Every once in a while, I would check in to see if she was interested or not, and the answer was usually no, until it wasn't. And so a few years into my work with Lane, I was presented with something I didn't have much experience with. A steady and contained woman who was willing to put in all the effort I was willing to put in. In what felt like the most mutual and reciprocal relationship I had ever been in. And part of me freaked out. Even though I had been trying so hard to convince her I was worth it, So Lane and I talked about it. I know now that what I was scared of was the realness of all of it. I knew deep down that this was it for me, that she was a fit, and that my days of answering to no one and living for myself without letting my defenses down were over if this was going to happen. And I'm certain Lane picked up on this as well. But he never said it that way. He asked me all the questions you might ask. How does it feel? What was the feeling like? We came to a determination that what would be best for me would be if I would just sit with all of those confusing feelings indefinitely. And so I did. I had a mantra I would repeat, just roll with it, just roll with it. And I rolled with it. I knew that I liked her. I knew that I was attracted to her. And I knew that I wanted to be around her. But with all the confusing feelings surrounding those realizations, I would just roll with them. And it didn't take long for the fear to give way to love and passion and connection. I needed someone to just ask me to sit with those feelings and to sit with me while I sat with those feelings. I often think about where I would be had I not had that someone. I just don't see how my mind would have moved towards my now wife without those sessions. So when people would ask me that question of what I wanted to do, all I could say to them was, I don't know what I want to do, I just know I don't want to be a doctor, mm-hmm. not, not the MD physician type. And that was partly rebellion. And, well, that, that was often largely rebellion. And because I wanted them to know me better. Um, but despite all that, I was a double major in college, biology and English. And I can remember coming home from college one day and my grandmother asked me what subjects I liked best. And I said, English, writing, poetry. And my grandmother, who came to this country at age 10, largely by herself and had to make a living for herself and her family said a lot of them called me Yaney. She said, Yaney, you want to be in English? What, what's that? She was also the one who, when I was born, her first comments were, he has hands like a surgeon. <laughs> How she knew that or why she said that, who knows, but that was her idea for me. Hmm. And so I went through college saying that, but then I became hard to put into work. Yeah, it's hard to put into work. Hmm. But it was as though if you're not a physician, you somehow fall off the end of the earth. That's given their experience. That's what they knew and that's what they thought. 
Right. And that's why my dad became a physician. And my mother's older brother became a physician. So I started medical school and I went two years complaining all the time. Hmm. And not knowing but staying there because I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know other paths to go that would fulfill me and and make me useful. Yeah. And bring me joy. When did you discover psychoanalysis? I was always interested in it. Uh, I went to the University of Chicago where Carl Rogers was and Heinz Kohut and a whole fleet of different psychiatrists. And I both liked it and didn't like it at all. I liked it because it seemed like, oh, these people know the answers to things. So let me read up on all this stuff. And as I took various courses from very distinguished people um, and heard their knowing snap decisions about things, I struggle with the fact that their snap decisions sounded wonderful, but they didn't touch me personally. And then because Heinz Kohut was at Chicago also, at a time when psychologists and psychiatrists were not even supposed to meet with each other. They weren't supposed to talk to each other. Psychologists in many states were not allowed to be therapists, much less therapists. So Rogers and... I don't know that you would know these names, John Schlein and James Butler and Laura Rice were very smart people hmm. and they were terrific listeners. And so I did my internship with them. It was a two-year internship. For those who don't know the names Carl Rogers and Heinz Kohut, let me try and give a primer. Carl Rogers and Heinz Kohut are two giants of psychotherapy, and in different ways. Remember that psychoanalysis was originally a discipline owned by psychiatry. As such, the only people who were trained in psychoanalysis for a long, long time were medical doctors. Heinz Kohut was of that tradition and was an ego psychologist who was concerned with the formation of ego and the self. He reconstructed many of Freud's theories around narcissism, mainly making the case that narcissism was not untreatable. Carl Rogers was a psychologist, not a medical doctor, who was known as one of the fathers of modern psychotherapy, in that he developed an applied psychology that was humanistic and client-centered apart from the psychoanalytic community although certainly informed by it. This was a tense relationship in the mid-20th century. The psychoanalysts believed that they had a claim to the talking cure, and Carl Rogers believed that there were other theories and techniques that could be useful in creating change for clients. Ironically, they both had a lot in common as individuals. Kohut was one of the first psychoanalysts to discuss empathy and its importance. Rogers also stressed an empathic response to the client. They were both interested in forming a relationship with the patient and less interested in treating the patient as an object of study. They of course had differences. Rogers developed a stance of unconditional positive regard with his clients while Kohut strived to treat his patients with more authenticity regardless of its positivity or negativity. Despite their similarities and their differences, they were both involved with work at the University of Chicago throughout the mid-20th century. 
and they seem to have very little interaction. Lane did what he could to glean as much as he could from both. And there was always something from that background, from Kohak and from Rogers. Rogers seemed to me to be a wonderful listener and an accurate listener. But it didn't feel like enough. So as I began teaching, it seemed like, why doesn't anybody in this graduate program that I'm in charge of, why don't they see the similarities? Between Kohut and Rogers? Yeah. Yeah. And so I kept including more Kohut and more Paul Ornstein and his wife. Paul and Anna Ornstein were Hungarian psychoanalysts and Holocaust survivors who were part of the self-psychology movement mostly associated with Heinz Kohut. And a number of others in his circle. And it felt like it went so closely to what we were calling existential phenomenological psychology. Existential phenomenological psychology. Yeah. That I just went with it. And then later on in my career, when when I had a sabbatical, mm-hmm. this stuff is so interesting to me. I wanna I wanna learn more of it. Were you able to interact with Kohut at all? Um, just a little bit. What I have heard about him. Narcissistic. <laughs> That's his claim to fame. Yeah. But listening to him and hearing him give a lecture or discuss a case was, it was both very smart and very thoughtful. Mm. And you've mentioned before that you also connected with him because you were a literature person. Because he wrote a book about psychoanalysis in the humanities. The case of Dr. Z, which was really about his life about and the life. struggles that he went through. I was so impressed that he had the courage and the openness to talk about these. Yeah. You went back and forth between Rogers and Kohut? Yes, and I thought that going back and forth, I didn't have to. I didn't have to choose one. Right. Why not use both? Why not make both of them useful? Which, when I realized that, I thought, well, no shit, Dick Tracy. That's what, in some way, led me to who I was. And they were both exceptionally curious men with very different styles, to be sure. Hmm. They led me to believe that you didn't have to choose one or the other. Right. That, of course, you could be some amalgam of both in addition to being your own self. Hmm. What kind of teachers were they? Kohut was masterful. Huh. He was masterful. Maybe if Rogers didn't come from a seminary background to this Jewish boy's ears, (laughs) I would have appreciated his abilities even more. Hmm. His concepts and so forth uh, made sense to me and touched me and yet as I said earlier there was something missing they felt like no there's more to say about all this than he's saying and so listening to him give a lecture I felt like he was terrific for what he was 
but it felt limiting to me. So you graduate from University of Chicago, and then you you find your way to Seattle. Right. After first being in New Haven, Connecticut for two years and being surrounded by old school analysts who scared the shit out of me <laughs> and who I didn't really like. Did you doubt your choice? I was still struggling for for my choice. How could I use them and how could I use others to find my way to myself? Hmm. And from there, we went to this new medical college in Toledo, Ohio, of all places. Hmm. And because it was brand new, I was given a tremendous amount of authority. And it was there I began putting into practice or or struggling to put into practice what I had learned from others and find myself in the doing of that. Hmm. Then we got to Seattle, which was sort of a a long story. (laughs) But we got to Seattle and I became part of this department and in charge of the graduate program, and it hadn't been around for long, had it? No, no, it was it was almost brand new. Yeah. And when I came there, and they told me I wanted to head up, I should head up the graduate program. I thought I don't think I want to do this. But at the first faculty meetings, I thought what they were talking about certainly didn't understand a lot of what they were talking about. I thought, Mm -hmm. this is bullshit. (laughs) And if we want to have a clinical program, where is the room in the program for clinical? And so because I was in charge of the graduate program, I introduced more and more. But, you know, we would have knockdown drag out fights about the true believers in continental philosophy and others like myself who thought, okay, this is really interesting theory. So how do you use it? That's where you got your reputation for not suffering fools. Yes. Yes. I've known a lot of people who have come out of this program at Seattle University, and they're all highly competent and many are exceptional clinicians. Some have been on this show before. All of them had Lane as a professor, and when they find out that I've been in treatment with him, they're intrigued. I'm also intrigued by what their experience of him must have been like in class. But at the same time, while I recommend this program to young people who are interested in becoming psychotherapists, I'm glad I didn't go there because it would have precluded me from being Lane's patient. One of the questions I've wondered is how your students would react to hearing you in a session. Because... I think one of the influences you've had on my practice being your patient is that when I came to you, I was learning all the theory and learning all the technique, but I didn't really experience our sessions as being full of any theory or technique. I just experienced you being a person. Yes. And it was a kind of a a realization of... I need to learn all the theory and the technique that I can and then just let it be in my subconscious as I be a real person with my patients. Well, that's, yes, that's, that's saying what I attempted to say much more clearly. (laughs) But I also had the benefit of having a therapist who was doing it. So having that perspective, this was a struggle in the early days of how, how are we going to not just be these academics with all this knowledge and make this useful. Right, right. It's great, but we have this knowledge, but is this really useful? 
when we're talking to somebody else. Yeah. I've come to associate it with kind of an existential mindset because I associate you with that mindset. Yes. Yes. But the way I think about it theoretically is that it's just asking, it's just looking at the questions of what the hell is happening, what's going on, how do we make meaning of it? That's right. That's right. I think about Lane in the same way that I dream of my patients thinking about me integral to my development, and yet in a facilitative way. It's important for me to know that I did the hard work and the changes in my life, but also to appreciate that he asked those questions that led me to think about how to do the hard work. I think I know that he would appreciate this as well. I think without our conversations, I'd still be wondering about trying to figure out how to do the hard changes. Or maybe I'd be blaming everyone else in my life for my problems without wondering what I could do about them myself. But when I talk to my therapist, the point is never to vent or to blame others. It's to say, I wonder what John thinks about this or feels about this, or what John can do differently to make this better. And I need those questions. They help me stay focused and centered. Those conversations have been infinitely useful in my life. Isn't it interesting that different people take the same bit of information and make very different meanings out of it? What can I learn from that? I mean, in some ways, I feel like the state our country is in would benefit from more existential psychologists. Yes. The very nature of meaning-making is kind of what's been under attack for the last few years. Yes. Yes. That leads me to a question that I've been asking all of our guests this season. Does psychotherapy have something to offer in regards to what we see happening in the news and in society? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, the standard response is, of course. What, what, what does that mean? But what does that mean? I think it means respect and curiosity for another's viewpoint. It also means how... Empathy is a very potent human response that can be used for disservice as well as service. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, ever since Bush and people thinking they know the answers, and then they follow this cult person, and it's grown and grown over the years until until, uh, number 45. You're saying that empathy can also be used to manipulate people who are hungry for something. Yeah. Yeah. Lane, thanks so much for being on the podcast. My pleasure, John. Thanks for asking. This has been Between Us. A special thanks to our guest, Dr. Lane Gerber. Between Us is produced by myself and my co-producer, Mason Neely, who also composes our music. You can find Between Us on social media. Please find us on wherever you find podcasts and subscribe and review. And until next time, Take care.